Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to this session on addressing the downstream effects of biofilm. This session is supported by an educational grant from Organogenesis. I'm joined today by my wonderful colleague, Steve Davis, research professor at the University of Miami School of Medicine in the uh, Department of Dermatology. I'm Greg Schultz. I'm a professor of obstetrics and gynecology, and more relevant, I'm director of the Institute for Wound Research at the University of Florida. Both Steve and I have substantial uh, financial disclosures, and you can see them here. And again, as you are aware, the faculty have been informed of their responsibility and that this activity has been independently reviewed for balance by the CME uh, creditors. Well, what are our learning objectives for today? Well, first, I'm going to start by examining the influence of bacterial biofilms on inflammation and especially the impact it has on creating elevated levels of protease activity and how that contributes to wound chronicity or impairment of healing. We'll also look at the downstream effects of biofilms specifically on the M1 and M2 type of macrophages. And we'll review key elements to eradicate biofilm, including debridement and preventing biofilm formation with appropriate antimicrobial therapy. And then certainly uh, Steve is going to talk about the latest scientific uh, methods to decrease bacterial biofilm, chronic inflammations and proteases, and really translate the microbiology and biochemistry that I'll talk about into uh, methods that can help initiate and support wound healing. So let's look by uh, examining the downstream effects of biofilm. Now you're all familiar with the four phases of normal wound healing of hemostasis, inflammation, repair, and remodeling. Um, and as you know, in the first major event after a damage to the skin is the clotting cascade is going to activate um, and this will prevent us from hemorrhaging to death. The other key aspect is that the platelets degranulate and they release a substantial amount of preformed active cytokines and growth factors. Those cytokines in particular are chemotactic factors for circulating neutrophils and macrophages, and they chemotactically draw those important inflammatory cells into the area of the wound. Now, as we'll see, normally the inflammatory response only lasts for about five to seven days, during which those neutrophils and macrophages are going to be able to engulf and kill the contaminating and colonizing bacteria. And then the inflammatory response will spontaneously begin to regress, undergo control apoptosis. This allows the cell then to move in uh, the wound, to move into the, the next phase, the third phase of repair. And that's when that provisional fibrin matrix that was laid down down during the clotting uh, cascade actually begins to be replaced and modified with more uh, important collagen and other extracellular matrix components, converting the initial, scar, uh, the initial uh, fibrin uh, matrix into a, an initial scar. In addition, uh, some of the uh, Fibroblasts will convert into myofibroblasts and they'll begin to contract the wound. And in, in humans, a full thickness excisional wound can actually contract about 20% of the original area of the wound. So it's not an insignificant component of, of the repair process. Finally, when the fibrin matrix has been modified enough with collagen and hyaluronic acid, the epithelial cells at the edge of the injury can begin to migrate across that emerging new scar matrix. Normally we say, okay, the wound's healed when the epithelium has closed, but as you know, that's not really the end of the whole wound healing process because for the next six to nine months, the initial irregular scar matrix that was laid down just as fast as the fibroblast could make it begins to be remodeled through the control actions of proteases and allowing more normal collagen and extracellular matrix uh, components to replace that provisional initial fibrin matrix. What we now know, however, is that, as, as uh, Steve and I will show you, is that a substantial amount 
of impairment of healing occurs when the inflammatory phase begins to be prolonged. And a key component of that, as I'll show you, is actually the presence of bacterial biofilms. So really, the major factor that impairs progression of healing in many wounds and acute wounds and converts them into chronic wounds is this chronic inflammatory phase. Well, I also want to really emphasize to you that we need controlled inflammation in the wounds, and that's to help both remove the bacteria by killing and engulfing, killing them through the um, actions of the neutrophils and macrophages, but also the neutrophils and macrophages secrete uh, the uh, proteases, the matrix metalloproteases and elastase. And as this diagram indicates, those proteases do important de enzymatic initial debridement of the wound, removing the damaged matrix so that new matrix molecules can be properly aligned as they're synthesized and secreted with the, uh, by the fibroblasts. So what's happened in these four types of typical chronic wounds. In other words, there's huge differences in, in the underlying comorbidities and etiologies, but is there a common molecular pathology that prevented those uh, an initial acute wounds from converting into these four types of chronic wounds? Well, what data from multiple publications and, and groups around the world have indicated is that there tends to be a common wound pathophysiology pathway. And what we see is that there's usually some form of repeated tissue injury combined with, with some ischemia. And now we appreciate especially a component of the bio burden. Now that's both the planktonic, the single bacteria, but also the biofilms. And what especially the biofilm structures do is they stimulate chronic inflammation in part through our toll-like receptor system, our innate immune system that has evolved receptors to recognize components of the uh, exopolymeric matrix of biofilms, especially the free extracellular bacterial DNA that about 20% of uh, most of the biofilm matrices. Now this stimulates chronic inflammation and draws in more neutrophils and macrophages. We can see that by elevated levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines and wound fluids. And this leads then to an imbalance of proteases inhibitors because those neutrophils and macrophages secrete those proteases we talked about and also continue to produce reactive oxygen species. Now, normally, as I showed in the good beneficial effects of inflammation, if the proteases and reactive oxygen species become elevated f at too high level for too long, they begin to have off-target effects. They're not perfectly only removing denatured matrix or only engulfing and killing bacteria. And what we've seen is that the prolonged protease and reactive oxygen species actually lead to destruction of proteins that are essential for healing. And those include both growth factors and receptors, as well as key matrix proteins that reduce cell proliferation and cell migration. And that results eventually in what we see as an acute wound that's converted into a chronic wound. So the real key in understanding this chronic inflammatory process is understanding what's causing it and trying to remove that and then reducing the devastating off-target effects that occur when the products of those inflammatory cells become elevated. Well, about 10 to 15 years ago, the concept of having bacteria present as biofilms in wounds um, was beginning to be understood and, and appreciated, but it actually turns out that the presence of biofilms causing chronic infection has been understood and acknowledged for many years. In fact, this excellent uh, review by DePozo and Patel in 2007 listed 18 clinical pathologies that were due in major part to the presence of bacteria and biofilms. And I won't go through all of these, but just obviously our otolaryngology colleagues know that chronic sinusitis is basically a biofilm-based disease causing chronic inflammation in the sinuses. Um, our, our colleagues that uh, deal with pulmonology, and now in the day of, of COVID-19, this becomes even more relevant because in cystic fibrosis patients, the terminal stages of that disease are due to a chronic pseudomonas biofilm that causes inflammation in the, in the lungs of those patients. The 
tissue scars and they basically suffocate to death. We know from our studies with urology that essentially any tube that goes through the skin like a urinary catheter or a dialysis catheter, when they develop chronic inflammation, it's due to the biofilm that's growing on the catheters themselves. And, and finally, we couldn't talk about biofilms if we didn't talk about orthopedics because it turns out that when there is a prosthetic joint that becomes infected, it's almost always due to the presence of a biofilm that is generated and growing on the titanium implants or sometimes in the adjacent soft tissue. Well, again, as the field began to mature and we began to understand more about the, the presence of biofilms and what they do in wounds, um, there were a number of key papers that um, have identified biofilms now in about 80% of chronic wound biopsies, uh, but only in a very small percent of acute wounds. And this mental panel B shows a scanning electron micrograph of what a typical large mature bacterial biofilm would look like on the surface of a wound bed. Now, it's also important for us to understand that biofilms are not just on the presence of uh, the surface of, of chronic wounds because biofilms can also be found in most chronic wounds, also in the areas under the surface of the wound bed, sometimes up to almost a millimeter deep in that. Also, the components of the biofilm matrix uh, are important because as shown in panel E, this red staining that you see is actually a uh, dye that is binding to free extracellular DNA from the bacteria. And our toll-like receptor 7 recognizes the unique CPG islands that are present only in bacterial DNA. So we've learned a lot about the presence of biofilms, but does that actually indicate that they're contributing to the failure to heal? Well, it turns out that uh, our, some of our best data that shows that biofilms actually impair healing of skin wounds comes from work uh, done by Tom Musto's lab and, and Dr. Cheryl. And basically what they did was to take healthy mice, make full thickness wounds in the skin back, uh, back skin, and then inoculate them with wild type staph aureus or staph epidermidis or just let them heal normally and what you can see is that the presence of these staph inoculum that will make a biofilm when they're present there is a significant reduction in the rate of healing compared to the uh, uninoculated controls but you can say, well, you know, there are a lot of things that could happen when they get infected. It's not just the biofilm. But the key information that came from their study was they repeated it, but this time when they inoculated with the wild type bacteria, they also treated them with an inhibitor that prevents the quorum sensing that is required for the bacteria to convert into biofilm. And now when the bacteria inoculated, but only prevented from forming the biofilm, there's no delay in healing because the mouse's immune system is able to recognize, engulf, and kill the planktonic bacteria, um, and they're not allowed to uh, form the biofilm. So this is very good data that shows that formation of a biofilm provides tolerance to the mouse's immune system and leads to the impairment of healing. Well, how does the immune response to these biofilms, how does it actually impair healing? Well, it, it turns out that, again, data uh, published by Bill Costerton in his pivotal papers on biofilms showed that when planktonic bacteria are inoculated onto uh, surfaces like implants or in dental uh, teeth uh, on our, our enamel, most of the time our immune system is able to recognize, engulf, and kill the planktonic bacteria as well as our antibiotics are very effective against that. But if those planktonic bacteria are allowed to attach, convert, and quorum sense into a biofilm, now our antibodies and our antiseptics and our antibiotics don't penetrate well. As I'll show you, they frequently are metabolically inactive, so the antibiotics are not very effective. And the uh, neutrophils and macrophages can engulf and kill them because the biofilm is tightly attached and bigger than they are. But they still activate and release these proteases and reactive oxygen species. And as I, I explained to you, it's the off-target effects of those that actually cause the damage to the proteins that are essential for healing. 
So how big are these differences in proteases? If we measure the level of the matrix metalloprotease activity in chronic wound fluids, we can see that there's a range of them, but compared to the acute wound fluid, they're on average about 50 times higher than in a healing wound. And in some cases are over 200 times higher than what you see in a healing wound. And similarly, if this hypothesis is correct, then when the biofilm-based wound care is implemented, the biofilms are, are debrided out and prevented from reforming. Now what happens is the protease levels begin to drop and the wounds can begin to go on and heal. Probably one of the best examples in a single patient of this tight correlation between inflammation, proteases, and healing is shown in this slide. So in this patient, this had a, a large chronic wound and higher levels of protease activity. When this patient got good debridement, good biofilm-based wound care, the inflammation dropped, the proteases dropped, and the wounds began to heal. But Unfortunately, as often happens, this wound just stalled. And what was happening was in the molecular environment of the wound, the protease levels were shooting back up. And it wasn't until this patient's chronic wound that was stalled, got good debridement, good biofilm-based wound care, the protease levels began to drop, and then the wound went on again to heal. So this shows the real tight temporal correlation between the presence of biofilms, the presence of inflammation, and the impairment of healing. So these types of data can help us uh, uh, conclude that inflammation in chronic wounds must be reduced to levels that allow to heal through having low protease activities. And upstream of that is the planktonic and especially the biofilm. So we control the biofilm, then we control the downstream effects. Now there is a, a, a nice uh, simple summary of this uh, in, in clinician friendly terms that's uh, available as a free download from Wounds International called MMPs Made Easy. So if, if the biofilms are there, why, why doesn't our immune system and why don't our antibiotics and antiseptics kill it very well? So why are these biofilms so hard to kill? Well, there are multiple reasons. Part of it, as I said, was the exopolymeric matrix of the biofilm just prevents diffusion of some of these large molecules in easily. Also, the exopolymeric matrix components can actually chemically react with and neutralize some of the chemically reacting microbicides. And most of the biofilm matrices have a, a high high net negative charge due to the polysaccharides and the DNA that are forming the matrix. And that can have a tendency to bind cationic components, such as silver, antibiotics, PHMB. But probably one of the most important things to understand is that there are frequently persister bacteria that have low metabolic activity in those mature biofilms. And again, antibiotics only kill metabolically active bacteria. Also, the metabolically active bacteria tend to be on the outer shell of the biofilm. And so this reduces the amount of oxygen that can diffuse into the center of the biofilm. When this creates a niche where anaerobic bacteria can uh, survive. And finally, these biofilms Biofilms are almost never monobacteria. They're usually polymicrobial. And so this creates an opportunity for synergism between the attached bacteria of different species, such as when MRSR, MSRA secrete resistant proteins that can protect bystander bacteria, and such as Pseudomonas that secretes catalase. Well, I'm going to just show you a very brief example of how tolerant these bacteria become when they're in biofilms. Um, and so again, from Bill Kosterson's data, he grew biofilm on a surface. He exposed it to one hour uh, exposure to dilute Dakin solution, dilute bleach, and then stained it with a dye that picks up dead or live bacteria. And you can see, frankly, that the outer layer of the biofilm is dead, but the inner layer of the biofilm is very much still alive. And the reason for that is that the hypochlorous acid, the sodium hypochlorite, actually chemically reacts with the excess uh, polymeric matrix and reduces the diffusion of the hypochlorous acid, the chemically reacting material, deeply into the wound. And that causes the reaction diffusion problem. 
the other thing that I think is really important for us to understand is the difference between planktonic and biofilm bacteria in terms of their sensitivity to antibiotics. So if we grow Pseudomonas aeruginosa in suspension cultures of planktonic bugs and expose them to tobermycin, within four hours, all of the planktonic bacteria are killed. If we take those same sensitive planktonic bacteria, grow them in a mature biofilm and expose them to tobermycin for four days, it kills less than one log. Now, visualization of this is, is helped by uh, this example from Montana State with Cunningham et al. and Phil Stewart's lab. And basically, what they did was to transform Pseudomonas bacteria with a, a plasma that expresses green fluorescent protein only when they're metabolically active. And you can see in this mature biofilm, only the outer shell of that biofilm is metabolically active. And remember, antibiotics only kill metabolically active bacteria by interfering with, inhibiting essential bacterial enzyme and transport systems that are only used when the bugs are metabolically active. So the principles of biofilm-based wound care have tried to pull together all of these components in this knowledge. And so we want to understand that frequent sharp debridements of wounds to physically remove biofilm communities is important because we don't kill them very well. And then we need to follow the debridement with dressings and microbicidal treatments that can prevent the reformation of biofilms, which can occur within relatively short time periods of just several days. Another question that is important is, can you see biofilms on the surface of wound beds? If you, if you need to debride it, can you see it? Well, the answer is actually kind of complex, but most biofilms are not visible on the surface of a wound bed because they're microscopic structures, as you saw in that scanning electron micrograph. And also much of the biofilm is beneath the surface of the wound. But we can see some indirect measures of a biofilm, which is the chronic inflammation. And so if we look at this uh, video from Randy Walcott, you can see, look at all of this slough that's on the wound bed surface. Now, the question is, is that biofilm? The answer really is no. That's mainly plasmin and, and other um, uh, fibrin components from the plasma. The biofilm and planktonic bacteria can grow in that, but the real damaging biofilm is present attached to the wound surface and under the surface of the wound bed. And so it requires extensive and effective debridement to remove, for example, this friable granulation tissue where the biofilm component is uh, housed in large part. So removing the slough, absolutely important. You got to get rid of the slough, but you also got to get rid of the components that are underneath the wound bed. And again, can you see a wound bed in, in this uh, diabetic foot ulcer that looks, you know, very well uh, debrided at the edges and, and some granulation tissue? Well, when Matt Malone took a biopsy of that and looked at it with scanning electron micrograph, there was a clear structure that is absolutely a biofilm matrix, in this case, uh, encapsulating the, the uh, staphylococcal materials. But you couldn't see that on the wound bed. But this has also then led uh, to a great review article by Steve Percival, where he summarizes where we see both planktonic and biofilm. And as we've indicated, you can see biofilm on the surface of wound bed if you use a microscope. You can also see it under the surface of the wound bed if you use biopsies. But in addition, in the slough, you can have both planktonic and biofilm growing and in the wound dressing. So when the planktonic bacteria grow attached to and grow in the wound dressing, they can also shed back micro colonies onto the surface of the wound bed. So understanding that the planktonic and especially the biofilm can be present in all of these different levels and areas of a, of a chronic wound and a wound dressing is important. And again, just wiping the back, the, the surface of a, of a wound bed on uh, using an, a, a pigskin explant model will actually reduce some of the biofilm, but it will not completely reduce it. And in, uh, another important point is that after three days of just daily wiping, it will actually grow back and reform the biofilm to the level that it was before. So how can bacteria uh, uh, form protective biofilms? How soon? Well, it turns out the answer is about three days. And that comes from data with Randy Walcott, where patients that came into his clinic were actually biopsied. We measured both 
uh, total bacteria as well as specific tolerant biofilm bacteria. And after debridement, the biofilm is effectively removed to very, very low or undetectable levels. But when they get treated only with a non-microbicidal dressing, after three days, the biofilm has totally reformed in those patients. So debridement's critical, but it needs to be combined with an appropriate treatment that prevents the biofilms from reforming. So do all microbicidal dressings effectively kill these biofilms on the lab model with explants of skin? The answer is no. Using this complex model where we grow these mature biofilms on the pig skin and then expose them to the different types of uh, non-microbicidal dressing or microbicidal dressings, we can reduce the level of biofilm in this model about one log to one and a half logs unless we use the iotaflex dressing, which is extremely effective at uh, removing the biofilm. And then finally, one of the last things that's come along recently are surfactants, and these are compounds that can lower the tension. There are both anionic, cationic, and non-ionic types of surfactants. But uh, one of the most important that is now available are non-ionic uh, surfactants because they have so much lower cytotoxicity. And when these non-ionic surfactants are applied, again, in the biofilm wound models, it will actually help to solubilize and remove the biofilm along with the components uh, uh, of the matrix that the biofilm are attached to. So again, using the pigskin explant model, we can see that daily applications and, and wiping for three days will totally remove a mature pseudomonas biofilm uh, from these wound uh, models. And you can see after day three, when we stain for residual bacteria, that after daily uh, application and wiping for three days, you can see there's no biofilm that is left. Well, these uh, concepts were uh, tried to come together in an international consensus using both clinicians, nurses, um, basic science researchers, and the key take home from that, again, which is a free download from Moon Repair and Regeneration, shows the important concept of step down, then step up treatment. And basically what that means is just start with your most effective and aggressive treatments first, using effective debridements combined with dressings that reduce the reformation of biofilms. As the inflammation reduces, the protease reactive oxygen decreases, and the wounds will, in most cases, begin to heal, and standard care can be used at that point. But if a patient has other comorbidities that require additional help, then you can step up by using advanced therapies such as growth factors, skin grafts, etc., that will accelerate the healing because they are in a uh, treatment uh, in a wound bed where the treatments will, will be effective. And this is just showing that, again, uh, after uh, using collagen dressings with antimicrobial reagents, you can also uh, reduce the CFUs of uh, pig skin wounds inoculated with Staph aureus. These concepts are summarized in the free download biofilms made easy. So in summary, what I've tried to do is give you an understanding of the basis of biofilms, that they're tolerant to many of the antibiotics, antimicrobials, and antiseptics, that they're present in a high percentage of chronic wounds when they are not healing, and they impair healing through this uh, production of elevated proteases and reactive oxygen. Biofilm-based wound care emphasizes the most effective treatments first, which is usually aggressive debridement, combined with treatments that prevent reformation of biofilm and then step down, step up therapy is the clinical translation of that information into therapies that can effectively reduce biofilms, reduce proteases, and when necessary, use advanced therapies that will actually further stimulate wound healing. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh... As Greg mentioned, my name is Steve Davis. I'm a research professor at the University of Miami. I've been here for 34 years. I study wound healing and wound infection using preclinical models. And today I'm going to tell you about some of the research that uh, we have done over the years um, and ways to eradicate biofilms and as well as enhance the healing process. As you've heard from Greg's talk, this is a very important concept. And certainly when you're looking at biofilm and 
things that may affect biofilm formation or reduce biofilm formation, it's important to look at this in a biofilm state. Whether you're looking at it in vitro, ex vivo, or in vivo, it's very important to look at it in a biofilm state. And so two of the really important characteristics that Greg touched upon were that these bacteria in a biofilm become firmly attached and that they can become very resistant to antimicrobial agents. So this is an older study that we, we've done to show how fast these biofilms can actually form in vitro. And here you can see a isolate of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And then the, within five hours, you get a lot of colonization. And then in seven hours, you can start seeing the EPS um, forming around the, uh, the, the, the colonies. And then within 10 hours, you can see that there is a mature biofilm already formed. So in vivo, we've seen pretty much the same thing. We haven't looked at earlier time points, which is one thing that we need to do. But we've seen that if we look at uh, scanning the images of a wound bed, and this is using a porcine model, um, where we've inoculate them with uh, Staph aureus, and then within 24 hours, you can see over here um, the EPS being um, covering the, uh, the bacteria. And within 48 hours, you see a much mature biofilm within 48 hours. So certainly ideal models are well-controlled, randomized clinical trials. And it's sometimes difficult to perform these studies, especially when you're looking at agents for um, effects on biofilm. And certainly, as you know, these clinical trials can be very expensive. Uh, certainly when you're doing these studies, most of the wounds are different sizes and different depths. And when you're doing your assessments, some rely on visual assessments, which as Greg mentioned, you cannot visually see a biofilm. Um, and then different people take different assessment methods for the bacteria using biopsies or swabs. And unfortunately, you, or fortunately, you're not able to inoculate people with certain types of bacteria just to study the back, that particular bacteria. So our ideal model is actually, or model of choice is the domestic pig. And you can see here some histology images of the similarities between pig skin and human skin. Uh, these include the thickness of the epidermis. There's also a distinct papillary dermis, the presence of the rete ridges, and also the hair distribution and cycle have been um, uh, shown to be very similar, as well as the vascularity. There are some differences, uh, such as uh, pigs do not have eccrine glands, so the phrase sweat like a pig is really not applicable, but the pigs do have another type of sweat gland um, available. They just don't have eccrine glands. So in order to study the uh, effects, we wanted to look at planktonic and biofilm bacteria. And, and these, in this particular study, we looked at wounds that were, um, these were partial thickness wounds that were inoculated with Staph aureus. And what we did was we had a set of wounds that we treated within 20 minutes. And so this doesn't allow the, the bacteria to form a biofilm. Basically, it's putting colonized or planktonic bacteria and, 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 and then treating within 20 minutes. And then we, in this particular study, we also allowed the bacteria to form by occluding them with a polyurethane film for 48 hours to treat a mature biofilm. And I showed you a scanning the image, image earlier of a mature biofilm that we see in these porcine wounds. So in this particular study, we looked at the effects of a triple antibiotic uh, ointment and compared to a topical mirpurcin the wounds were treated twice a day um, with both of these particular uh, agents. And what we found is uh, not surprising in that fact that if we treat the wounds within 20 minutes, you see a significant, almost a complete reduction within 24 hours with the treatments against the planktonic bacteria. But if you wait 48 hours and then apply the treatment, you can see here that it takes five days to get a few log reduction which means clinically you need to continue to treat this wound. Otherwise, these wounds are going to recolonize and form more biofilms and basically um, delay the wound healing process. So there are various ways to treat biofilms. One is actually looking at agents that can actually prevent their attachments. And some people have looked at lactoferrin, which is an iron binding protein that actually inhibits bacterial growth. 
And uh, there has been some studies suggesting in vitro that this could be a very effective methodology. However, there is limited um, studies in vivo showing its efficacy. Another one that uh, Greg mentioned earlier was the uh, stopping the quorum sensing. So these are the signal molecules that basically tell the bacteria once they start forming the biofilm whether to proliferate or not. So once they reach a quorum, then basically after that they become dispersed. And um, as Greg uh, mentioned during his presentation, people are looking at ways to actually break up these uh, biofilms, including the ultrasonic uh, debridement that he was talking about, as, as well as cold steel debridement. And some people have shown that electrical stimulation can actually help with delivery of certain agents into the biofilm to uh, help break them up. And um, uh, so this was what I just said about they allow the, uh, once you break up the biofilm, you basically allow the topicals in combination therapies to actually uh, um, uh, get into the wounds and kill the bacteria. And it's much more easier, as I mentioned, to kill the planktonic bacteria versus the biofilm bacteria. And other people are looking at other ways to enhance the, dis the uh, dispersion of the bacteria. And uh, in collaboration with Karen Sauer, um, I'm gonna talk to you about some of the recent work that we've done there. So as uh, Greg mentioned, one of the most important steps is uh, debridement and certainly uh, wound cleansing can be very important as well. And basically by removing the bacteria, so what we did was we designed a study where we wanted to see if debridement can actually re remove the, the biofilm associated bacteria. And so in this particular study, we inoculated the wounds with, with MRSA. Here you can see a photograph of what it looks like. And then we covered them for, for 24 hours to allow the biofilm to form. And then we debrided the wounds and we compared different um, types of debridements. One was a hydrosurgical debridement. We also looked at pulse lavage irrigation and also just cold steel curetting. So the wounds were basically biopsied at, uh, uh, immediately after debridement and we used a scrub solution to get the bacteria out. And it's important to note that when you do look at active agents, that it's uh, required by the FDA to use a neutralizer. And what a neutralizer does is basically neutralize the activity of the active agent upon the recovery of the bacteria. So you're not really showing false kill of what's happening in the wound itself. So in this particular study, we biopsy the wounds, we do zero dilutions, um, and then we use a spiral plater system, which is used in the food industry to quantitate bacteria. And we use selective plates to grow particular bacteria. Um, the, this plate right here is a ORSAB plate that will only grow MRSA bacteria. This plate in the middle here is a plate that will grow only Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And the blood plate pretty much grows any bacteria. Um, so you can look at a total bacteria count as well as, as, as well as focusing on the particular bacteria of interest. So in our preliminary results, we found that um, the hydrosurgery debridement method um, was very effective at reducing the bacteria. So, so in our studies, we find if you get at least a two log reduction, that is usually considered to be significant. Um, surprisingly, the pulse lavage that we used was not very effective and curetting only uh, reduced it by maybe almost uh, three-fourths of a log. So more recently, we looked at a coblation technology, and this uses radio frequency energy to basically deliver a focused plasma. And um, we published this um, uh, back uh, several years ago. And the way we did this particular study is we inoculated the wounds with MRSA. And these were deep dermal wounds. These were down to almost the fat down to three millimeters in depth. We covered them with a polyurethane film to allow for that biofilm to form. And then we looked at two settings of the coblation, the default setting um, as well as a maximum setting that the device came at. And we compared it to the hydrosurgery, cold steel, and then we had a control as, as a no debridement. Um, and basically, what we um, looked at was day zero, immediately after debridement, day two, day nine, and day 21, we took biopsies for bacteria counts, and then we also took an incisional biopsy so we can actually measure the healing rate of that wound. And here you can see some clinical photos of the, 
to the, of curating what it looks like afterwards. And here you can see all the slough and debris on top of this wound. And then after curating, it looks like a nice healthy wound bed. And it looks like we may have gotten all that bacteria or biofilm out of the wound. Here's the coblation technology. And here you can see similar, we uh, removed all the, uh, the nasty slough and necrotic tissue, it appears. And uh, the nice thing about this particular device is that it is um, uh, somewhat uh, hemostatic when uh, using this particular device as compared to certainly cold steel. So here you can see our results. Um, and what we found is that immediately after debridement, all of these methods were really good at reducing the uh, bacteria counts by one and a half to two logs. However, interestingly, the coblation at the maximum setting showed the best on days two, nine, and 21. And this was only with a one-time debridement, which is kind of interesting um, that we saw such a, a large decrease over time and that the bacteria weren't able to recolonize. So what effects on healing did the coblation have? Well, we actually saw that there was an increase with the maximum coblation by getting rid of the bacteria, but this was not statistically significant. You can see the error bars there. So what about wound cleansing? Um, there's a lot of wound irrigation systems out there. Um, certainly, um, we wanted to address whether you could actually flush or scrub the bacteria out of the wounds. And um, back in the early 2000s, our group published a study of looking at the um, effect of both flushing and scrubbing the bacteria out. And the, what we did in this particular study is, well, we inoculated partial thickness wounds with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We allowed the biofilm to grow for 24 hours. And then we came back to that wound. And what we did was we basically flushed the wounds with a scrub solution three times. And that was removing the loosely attached bacteria, which we are calling the planktonic bacteria. And then what we did was we went back to that same wound and we scrubbed the firmly attached bacteria out. And that's what we're calling the biofilm associated bacteria. And as you might not be surprised is that we did find a lot more out of the 30 samples that we looked at, we found a lot more um, of the uh, biofilm associated bacteria, the ones that were firmly attached as compared to the plectonic bacteria. So we also wanted to look at uh, ways to look at uh, different treatment regimens. This was a study where we looked at a PHMB solution on just irrigating the bacteria out. And we wanted to see whether we could remove the uh, bacteria simply by wound irrigation. And um, as Greg mentioned, the PHMB basically can interfere with the cell membrane in, um, resulting in loss of integrity and in cell death and basically reduce the, and inhibits the uh, 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 bacterial metabolism of the bacteria. So in this particular design, we made the deep partial thickness wounds inoculated with MRSA, allowed that biofilm to form within 24 hours, and then we treated and rinsed the bacteria out twice a day using various irrigation systems, including in this is, your, is um, the PHMB solution, a ring of solution, uh, hyperchlorous acid solution, we compared it to stair water, and also to other um, ir irrigation solutions that are found out there. And what we did was we recovered the wounds on day three, and we had a set of wounds that we recovered on day six. And here are our results. And what we found was that um, irrigating the wound with the PHMB solution was the most effective on both days three and day six. But if you look at this, we still don't completely eliminate or we can't basically irrigate the bacteria out, even doing it twice a day for um, up to six days. So this is telling us that we need to combine this with debridement. And, and that's actually what we looked at. We wanted to see if debriding the wounds and then adding a wound cleanser. In this case, we looked at the hyperchlorous acids treatment and we're calling this a wound management solution. Um, uh, for the results section, it's called a wound management solution. And hyperchlorous acid, as you may know, can actually penetrate the bacteria cell walls and destroy them with the oxidation potential. So what we did in this particular study is we created the deep dermal wounds that we did previously. We inoculated with MLRSA. In this case, we allowed three days for the biofilm to form. And then we applied the um, uh, uh, irrigations after debridement, no, I'm sorry, after 
after three days, all of the wounds were debrided, and then we immediately applied the irrigation solution. And we did this twice a day for the first four days, and then once a day thereafter. Um, and here are our results compared to saline. And basically what we found is that rinsing the wounds with this uh, wound management uh, solution, we were able to reduce the bacteria counts compared to the saline control in the baseline. And here you can see, we take a baseline um, prior to debridement, and then we were able to reduce the bacteria counts down a few logs with the debridement process. So what about healing? So with the same study, we took biopsies to look at the wound healing effects, and we did see significant enhancement on day eight by reducing the bacterial load. So by possibly also reducing the inflammatory response, it may have contributed to the increase in epithelialization that we did see on day eight, but on day nine, they pretty much were fairly equal. I mean, we have looked at other agents um, as far as molecular events that may happen and have shown that antimicrobial peptides um, can either inhibit wound healing or actually accelerate wound healing. And in, that, in those particular studies, what we've seen is that uh, when we've seen a delay in the wound healing response, we've actually seen a uh, increase in IL-8 and TNF-alpha with those wounds um, that were delayed in the healing response. But in this case, we saw in this particular study, no difference in the white cell infiltrate score, which was kind of interesting. You would expect, we would see, especially later on, a possible decrease by removing that bacteria. Um, you would think that we would see a decrease in the white cell infiltrate score, but we did not see that. So one important aspect when considering wound and ir irrigation solutions is that low pressures have been shown to be fairly effective at removing bacteria, but you got to be careful with higher settings because if you uh, use a higher pressure, you have the risk of actually penetrating that bacteria or that biofilm deeper into the tissue and injuring the tissue um, uh, itself. So what do you use after debridement and cleansing? Well, there's a lot of variety of treatments out there, different dressing materials, different matrix materials. In this particular study, we looked at a wound matrix material that is supposed to help in the assistant of the healing process. And certainly, as we all know, these matrices are designed to help support cell growth, stimulate angiogenesis and granulation tissue formation, and basically help with the overall healing process. But what happens to bacteria if they're around? Can these matrix prevent these bacteria from getting in or do they stimulate their growth? And um, if there's bacteria already in the wound, may it have an effect on the biofilm? So in this particular study, we looked at the effect of a purified collagen matrix that contains PHMB. We're calling this uh, the PCMP product that we evaluated. And what we did was we created, similar to the other study, deep dermal wounds. We inoculated them with MRSA for 72 hours. And then we did use the curette to debride the wounds as would be done clinically. We performed baseline, um, uh, uh, we had baseline wounds so that we knew the bacterial load before actually treating the wounds. And then we recovered for microbiology and for wound healing. And then this particular study really looked at the effect of this PCMP product compared to a similar product, but it has more layers um, to it. And it also has a little bit more PHMB with it. And, and, and we also compared it to an antimicrobial hydrofiber dressing and also a, uh, another antimicrobial dermal scaffold, as well as an antimicrobial wound gel. And what we found here is um, fairly interesting that both of these products that contain the PHMB showed the lowest reduction on the later days of assessments. And here again, you can see before debridement and then after debridement. So we're able to reduce it initially down to almost two logs. But later on, we actually do see with a one-time application of some of these products, um, a nice decrease in the bacterial loads. And it is interesting to note, we also looked at wound healing and did find that the PCMP did uh, have an increase in epithelialization rate and an, epi an increase in granulation tissue formation and uh, the one that had actually more PHMB was able to reduce the white cell infiltrate 
but this was only on day four that we saw this result. So the, one of the last ways that I'm gonna talk to you about ways to treat biofilms is with, uh, by enhancing its dispersion. And once it's dispersed, as I mentioned to you previously, it's much easier to kill. So in this um, particular study, we worked with Karen Sauer from uh, SUNY Binghamton, New York, and looked at uh, um, an a, 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 uh, enhancement of dispersion factor that they had. And it's important to note that Pseudomonas actually requires this pyruvate in order to actually form the biofilms. And if you're able to basically um, deplete the uh, pyruvate, it actually induces the biofilm dispersion. And I'm gonna show you some studies that we did here. So we basically also looked in vivo the effect of this dispersion factor in combination with a topical tobramycin. So here's some of the in vitro studies that her group actually performed. And what we see in uh, these three, um, these three um, images up on top, these are confocal images, that these are four-day biofilms that were treated with the uh, enzyme. And basically you can see here the gap in between here showing the dispersion. And when you actually count the uh, dispersed colonies, you see a much more higher number of the, the bacteria being dispersed out. And here you can see the actual average diameter of the microcolonies that appear to be dispersed. And it's much higher once you add the um, enzyme in this case. So in this particular study, we um, also looked at the in vivo effects on um, wounds that were inoculated with pseudomonas. Um, these were second degree burn wounds. We allowed a 24 hour biofilm in this case. And then we had um, different treatment groups. We had different concentrations of the enzyme to a high and a low concentration with and without tobramycin. Our positive control was tobramycin alone, and then we had an untreated control. We had sets of wounds that we evaluated on day three and sets on day six as well. And in this particular study, instead of taking a punch biopsy, we used the method that I told you previously about our flush and scrub technique. So what we did was we actually recovered the bacteria initially using the flush, and then we went back and we actually looked at the biofilm associated bacteria and quantified that as well. So in this study against the planktonic bacteria, what we found is that there was a dose response effect with the enzyme with tobramycin, and it was better than the tobramycin by itself, as you can see here. And we saw similar results against the biofilm associated bacteria. However, it didn't reduce it as much. So there was a dose response effect with the combination therapy. So one of the best ways to prevent biofilms is actually don't allow the pathogen to gain entrance. And there's really no such thing as a sterile wound. Um, certainly by debriding a wound early and maybe using a wound cleanser, you actually can reduce the bacteria that are already present in the wound. Um, but the best thing to do is actually prevent them. And we have shown that different occlusive therapies, um, especially like hydrocolloid dressings that are very occlusive to the normal skin surrounding the wound are very effective at keeping the bacteria out. Whereas some hydrogel materials and some like even a polyurethane material, which allows channels of the back, which allow channels so that the bacteria can gain entrance. Um, so physical therapy such as dressings can be useful um, to prevent the entrance of bacteria and reduce the ability of the bacteria to form biofilms. And a, a, a study we also looked at was just uh, an antimicrobial gauze. So as a potential secondary dressing to use a uh, one that contains PHMB, we found to um, significantly reduce the ability of the, ba the bacteria to gain entrance into the wound and to um, uh, uh, induce biofilm formation. So, and for acute wounds, uh, we've looked at a cyanacrylate, which is a liquid bandage uh, type of product and found that this adhesive actually, once applied, actually prevents the bacteria from gaining entrance. And it did have antimic uh, antimicrobial back, uh, activity against bacteria that were in the wound already. So basically, it's good to kill bacteria, as we all know, and reduce biofilms, but it's very important not to harm the wound healing process. And certainly, um, 
This is a recent article showing a silver material, silver dressing that we looked at and found that um, uh, on non-infected wounds that it did not inhibit the wound healing process. And it's very important that, uh, you know, that uh, the wound healing aspect of, uh, of these therapies are also e evaluated. So in conclusion, it's gonna be, you know, take various strategies, combination therapies to actually prevent and treat biofilms. Certainly, as you heard from Greg's talk, debridement is very important. And certainly combination therapies are needed to have successful wound healing. So I would like to just acknowledge uh, my research uh, collaborators that I, uh, I have, um, I, as, as I mentioned to you, I started uh, at the University of Pittsburgh back in the early 80s with Pat Mertz and Bill Eaglestein, who actually were the, uh, my uh, mentors for almost 20 years. And I've learned quite a lot from them. And I certainly have to acknowledge all of the work that uh, in, in collaborations. And then certainly my team and other, some of our old residents that we've worked with and uh, our collaborators at uh, SUNY Binghamton as well. So I would like to thank you all. And this concludes our presentation and I hope you found it informative. Hello everyone, this is Greg Schultz along with Steve Davis and we wanna thank you for watching the recording that we put together on assessing the downstream effects of biofilms. And we have a number of questions in about five minutes. So uh, Steve and I are each gonna take uh, two questions and see if we can stay within that five minutes. And if not, then we'll uh, uh, try to add as much as we can go. One of the questions that has come up uh, is asking about, what about using direct contact ultrasonics and can they be used to remove biofilms effectively? The answer is very much yes. We have actually used two different direct contact ultrasonic devices um, and they are effective in dislodging and removing biofilms from the pigskin explant model. Uh, but much like with the non-contact ultrasonics, they are even more effective when you substitute the the ultrasonic transmission fluid uh, from saline to a reasonable antimicrobial solution, something you know that either has dilute silver, uh, hypochlorous acid, or uh, PHMB. So they are definitely effective, and I would encourage you to look at those, but encourage you also to look at uh, substituting or exchanging the ultrasonic fluid for something that has more antimicrobial activity because it has very sustained and uh, bigger reductions in biofilms. Steve, you want to do the next question? Sure. Um, one of the questions is uh, about whether there's a gold standard with a certain PSI when irrigating a wound and whether there's a preference between just irrigating versus um, using regular gauze to um, clean the wounds. Um, uh, I think you may have seen from one of the slides that uh, was presented that it's recommended between a 5 and 15 PSI that uh, is effective at removing the bacteria. However, if you increase it higher than this, it can have detrimental effects where you're actually pushing that uh, bacteria further down into the wound. So there's a balance in between that. And certainly in combination with irrigation, moistening a, a gauze material and trying to wipe away the uh, biofilm and bacteria is certainly a, a good option as well. So I'll take the next question. And uh, the, really the question is asking, is there a way to detect the presence of biofilms on a wound bed without sending the wound tissue to a test lab to do the more sophisticated uh, biofilm CFU measurements? And the, uh, the Answer to that, which I didn't present, but the answer is yes. And as a disclosure, this is a University of Florida patent, but we have developed a biofilm wound map technology that uh, is based on taking a uh, membrane that we use in the lab all the time to particularly do what are called southern blots, that is looking at DNA on, on uh, acrylamide gels. You push this membrane, positively charged membrane, down into the wound bed for about a minute. It 
interacts with and tightly binds the exopolymeric matrix of the biofilm, which includes uh, substantial amounts of bacterial DNA as well as some uh, negatively charged polysaccharides. We then just submerge that membrane um, in a little tray of a cationic dye for about a minute, then rinse it with a solution for about a minute, and the biofilm exopolymeric matrix uh, is stained um, usually a red color on the membrane. And so you, you can look at a, 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 a two-dimensional map of where the biofilm is on the surface of the wound. Now, Dr. Gojiro Nakagami at the University of Tokyo and the Wound Clinic has published two papers. We will post those citations for you at the end of this. Um, and he reports using this technology to help the clinicians know where biofilms are on the surface of wound beds to debride it. And if they debride the biofilm out, they have significantly lower amounts of slough and improved wound healing uh, within the next week. If they don't get all the biofilm out, they have lots of slough and no significant amounts of wound closure. Steve. And I, yeah, and I just wanted to say we did examine that using our porcine model and found it to be able to detect biofilms. Uh, um, which was very interesting. Exactly, and and this does not detect planktonic bugs and does not detect anything in normal wound healing beds. And of course, Steve's uh, experiments with the pigs were critical to take it to the next level of verification. Okay, so the next question is, do you recommend using a wound cleanser before or after debridement? Um, certainly, uh, definitely after debridement, um, and it is suggested, possibly before debridement as well, but there's a possibility by um, basically cleansing the area before debridement, you may actually be um, removing some of that biofilm and then allowing it to get into the debrided area. But uh, certainly it wouldn't hurt to do, to, to do uh, both, I don't think so. Um, and then uh, another question was uh, the frequency. What should the frequency of debridement is? And certainly um, the, when you have visible slough and necrotic debris is when you should debride. So it really depends on, upon the type of wound. So I think we're right at the end of our five minutes. And again, Stephen, I wanna thank you for participating in this session with us.